Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, What Does Your Desk Say About You? Let's Get Organized. My name is Jeff Murphy, and I'm an Associate Director in the BU Alumni Relations Office, as well as a proud alumnus of the BU Questrom School of Business. Today's webinar is sponsored by the BU Alumni Association and is offered to our 300,000 alumni around the globe. Throughout your career, the BU Alumni Association is committed to helping you define and achieve your professional goals. We aim to do this by providing alumni with access to a series of valuable online tools and social media communities. It's important that we get your opinion on how we're doing, so we very much look forward to receiving your feedback via a short survey that will be emailed to all of you later today. I know we have alumni joining us today from places like Canada, Switzerland, Greece, San Diego, Fort Collins, Colorado, Charlotte, Hoboken, Santa Fe, New Mexico, and of course dozens of Massachusetts alumni from towns like Acton, Wakefield, Medfield, Salem, and more. For each and every one of you out there, please know that we really do value your opinion on this and every program that we offer. Before I introduce today's speaker, some brief housekeeping notes. As you know by now, this webinar is being hosted on the Adobe Connect online meeting platform. If you experience any trouble with the audio or visual portions of today's presentation, I'll ask that you please contact Adobe Connect directly. And if you want to jot down this phone number, it's 1-800-422-3623. Today's presentation is being recorded and will soon be made available for on-demand viewing on the BU Alumni Association website, which you can find at www.bu.edu slash alumni. Our speaker today is very eager to answer any questions you may have, and you're welcome to submit them throughout the presentation using the Q&A chat box you should see at the bottom of your screen. We hope to get to as many questions as we can. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for the day. Presenting from our broadcast studios here on the BU Charles River campus is Questrom School of Business MBA alumna Marilyn Cruikshank. Marilyn is an organizing and productivity consultant. Through her business, Creative Simplicity Organizing and Productivity, she has helped hundreds of professionals, families, small businesses, and not-for-profit organizations get better organized and become more efficient with their space, time, paper, possessions, and resources. Her work consists of hands-on, one-on-one organizing, kickstart consultations, and interactive group workshops. Marilyn has a background in education and museum work and is a frequent presenter at conferences, webinars, and community education classes. As mentioned earlier, she holds an MBA with a nonprofit concentration from BU and a BA in art history from Trinity College. She's a Golden Circle member of the National Association of Professional Organizers and is a past recipient of the American Alliance of Museums Nancy Hanks Award for Professional Excellence. Marilyn, thanks again for being with us today. I'm going to go ahead and get your slide deck up and running, and then the floor will be all, you, uh, be all yours. That sounds great. Everyone hear me? Sounds good on my end, Marilyn. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you to Jeff Murphy and the Boston University Alumni Association for hosting this webinar. It's great that all of you are spending some time with us to focus on organizing. And um, so thank you for taking the time out of your day. Let's get started and let's get organized. So we're going to start just taking a step back. We're going to think a little bit about the context of where we're going. What is clutter? What is organizing? What are the benefits to being better organized? We all know the benefits, but have we thoughtfully considered them? We're going to go through seven steps to organization, and then we'll leave time, as Jeff said, for a question and answer at the conclusion. We have two poll questions inserted today as well to get some of your feedback and input um, to make our session a little bit more um, engaging and interactive for you. So, um, so welcome, and um, here's what we're going to cover. Okay, so what is clutter? So clutter is referred to um, in, in different ways as um, different things, but basically it's the excess stuff that's around us. It's in our physical spaces as well as in our digital spaces. As we all know, that um, piece of the pie is growing um, bigger and bigger. Um, clutter is sometimes referred to as the physical manifestation of stress as well because the more we have around us and the more we're dealing with on a daily basis, the more stressful it becomes for us. It can be a visual distraction because there's a lot of it that we see and we can't focus because uh, there's so much of it. Um, sometimes clutter is decision avoidance, right? The more things um, the more things gather, the more we avoid them because we just don't want to deal with them. The word I hear very frequently from clients is overwhelming. 
um, clutter becomes overwhelming to us. The things around us become overwhelming to us and we get stuck because we can't move on. We have so much of these things. Um, these things can be data, they can be stuff. Um, in the workplace specifically, because um, we're referring today to um, keeping our desk more organized, it can be mail, memos, newsletters, texts, emails, paper, tweets, knickknacks, mementos, research materials, excess supplies, you name it. Um, it's all there. And I'm sure all of you are kind of looking around your spaces where you're sitting um, right now and thinking maybe some of this is even clutter. So, um, so let's deal with that today. On the flip side, when we think about organizing, we need to think about the fact that organizing is a process. It's not a one-time event. We're not going to just get organized once and then forever be organized. Um, it's something that's ongoing and needs to happen regularly in everyone's life. Um, organizing is about creating systems that help us to manage the day-to-day, -day, whether that be the day-to-day -day in our office um, spaces, our workspaces, or at home. Organizing is also often referred to as decision making. So if the clutter is the deferred decisions, the organizing is the actual decision taking place and you're, you're taking action and deciding where things are going to go, what things are going to be kept, what things you're going to part with. There's not really a one-size-fits-all approach to organizing. It looks a little different for each person and the way you live and work. So that's important to remember. You don't want to punish yourself if you are not um, organizing like your neighbor or your friend or your spouse or partner. Um, you really want to tailor it to what works for you. It's also important when you're thinking about organizing to look at how things come into your space or into your life. Um, for example, if you're going to a lot of trade shows and conferences, are you picking up a lot of freebies that you're then bringing back home and kind of just letting clutter up your space, whether they be t-shirts or frisbees or pens or letter openers, whatever they might be, um, you know, do you need those? Are those essential? Um, some of us have coworkers that um, put things in our spaces, right? They drop papers maybe in your office um, and um, also email obviously um, is something that comes at us, you know, constantly and um, we sometimes don't have as much of a control over it as we would like. So it's really about looking at how things are coming into your space and how you maybe can deal with that flow and that process. Um, so that's kind of how we sum up what organizing is. So we want to get better organized. Obviously, we're all um, listening in today to figure out some strategies. What are the benefits? What, what will it do for us if we kind of declutter and um, consider the process and then jump in for organizing? Well, the title of the webinar, What Does Your Desk Say About You? People notice. Okay, people that you work with, your colleagues, your coworkers, they see what your space looks like. And what your space looks like has an impact on how people view you professionally. 73% of managers and associates say they form impressions of coworkers by the way their desks or workspaces are organized. So it's a big percentage, three quarters of uh, the population of people that you're working with are taking note. They're looking at how um, your space is kept. So that's really important. And whether it's in your workspace or if you're out on the road meeting clients, wherever you might be, you want to present yourself as professional. So the more organized, the better. Productivity is key as well. The more efficient we are, the more we can get things done. And um, that's something we're always striving for in our world of busyness. So you might say, so what? Right? My desk has a lot of stuff on it, but I can always find what I need when I need it. Well, that's fine if that works for you. But you honestly want to think about the fact that you're working with decreased efficiency. You're taking time to look for things constantly in that um, process of, you know, going to those piles and searching rather than having the things handy in their place and quickly accessible. So something to really consider. Stress reduction is also a benefit. Um, as I talked about before, using the word overwhelm is very common for um, all of us these days with everything going on. And if you're better organized, oftentimes the stress is reduced, right? We reduce the volume. We reduce the overwhelm. We have an easier time processing information. And we can focus on our work. That's also um, pretty key to what we want to try to do is not focus on looking for things, searching for lost items, um, trying to track down colleagues to find things. We want to focus on our priorities, our vision for our, um, you know, for our positions and um, getting the work done. 
Okay, Jeff, so let's bring up our first poll question. Okay, so if everybody wants to take a shot at um, giving some input on our first poll question, the question is, on average, how much of your day is wasted looking for lost or misplaced items? What do we think? Is it five minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, or one hour, 60 minutes? Marilyn, are you able to see those answers coming in? I am, yes. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, it looks like we still have some people finishing up their responses. Great, really interesting. Okay, well, it looks like most of you think that on average, only about five minutes of your day is wasted looking for lost or misplaced items. Honestly, um, that's that's really interesting because the actual number is 60 minutes or one hour per day. So the Wall Street Journal reported that U.S. workers waste an average of six weeks a year, or roughly 60 minutes, one hour per day, searching for missing information in messy desks, files, etc. Wow, that's a lot of wasted time in a world of busyness and trying to get more done. So that's really something to consider. How can we change this? Right? And, and, and maybe it's a reflection of the folks that are listening today. You're, maybe you're not spending um, that average time, which is fantastic. If you're spending less than that, that's where you want to be. So that's really key. So good for you. So seven steps to organization. These seven steps are um, just a breakdown for you of how you can think about the process of reducing, simplifying, and then putting systems in place. The first, reduce before organizing, basically referring to the declutter process we spoke of um, when we talked about um, what is clutter and um, jumping into your spaces and thinking about how can you reduce and simplify. Number two, give everything a home. Ask yourself, where does this go? Okay, um, we'll talk a little bit more about each of these as we go through. So I'm just going to give you a brief introduction now. Number three, make your space work for you. Right, Not the one-size-fits-all um, approach, but only what works for you and the way you live and the way you work. Four, put it away now. Doing it now saves time later. Five, develop systems and routines. This is the essence of organizing, um, creating the, the systems and processes that work for you over time and become a habit. Uh, number six, getting rid of the piles. Uh, lots of us have piles, especially um, paper. So uh, that's a big, big organizing challenge. Piles, as we said, are deferred decisions. Maintain it, number seven. Um, very key in the process. You can um, declutter. You can get yourself organized. But then if you drop off and don't keep up with um, the processes and the systems, you're back to square one again. So it's really important to think about maintaining it. OK, number one, reduce before organizing decluttering, getting rid of things that are not needed um, and really not essential to your everyday um, work life, in your workspaces, your home life, and personal life in your, um, your homes. So we talked about clutter. Um, now let's get rid of it, OK? Reducing the volume before we determine the systems. There's a woman in, um, based out of New York City, Julie Morgenstern is her name. She's an author. She's written a lot of, um, she's a, an organizer and a productivity specialist, but she's also an author. Has written a lot of different books about organizing, and one in particular is called Organizing from the Inside Out. And in that book, which I believe was her original um, first book, she talks about using the word space as an acronym and using each of the letters in the word space as a different step in the organizing process. Now, there are a lot of different um, people out there that um, have a lot of different ideas about how you can get organized and make suggestions, and this is just one of them. But it's a nice, simple way way to um, think about the organizing process, and so I wanted to share it with you today. So the first step in the process, the S in the word space, stands for sort. And if you're using um, your desktop as an example, you would look at your desktop and see all the different things on top of it and think about sorting them into like categories. 
You want to have a, a staging area, so perhaps it's another part of your desk or even a folding table that you bring into your space to start to spread things out. But you want to sort like items. So some of the items on our desktop might be our office supplies, our mementos and kind of knickknacks, um, writing instruments, um, our um, computer, um, phone, our paper, obviously, um, files, all different um, categories. So sort the like items together so you can see everything um, laid out in front of you. Then the P in the process stands for purge. And what that means is you're going to start to make decisions about what's there. Right? You're going to decide, is this something essential that I need to keep? Or is this something that I can part with, place elsewhere, return to somebody, whatever the case may be. Um, there are what we call decluttering questions you can kind of ask yourself, depending on the space that you're starting to purge and the items you're purging. But some basic questions you can ask are, you know, how long, um, how long has it been since someone asked me for this? You know, do I really need to keep it? Is it something that I refer to regularly or I've never looked at it? Um, is this something that someone's going to ask for? Um, have I used this? So ask yourself questions that are relevant to your situation and um, what the objects are. And as you purge, you're going to be reducing. So um, that's the key. You hopefully will be able to you know, sort through and weed out the things that are not necessary for you and, um, and your workspace. The A in the process, assign a home, that's for you to determine where the item is going to be placed back. OK, so where, where are you going to put it back? Where are you going to assign it a place that it's going to stay and you're going to know where it is? That's its home. Okay, so you want to look around your space and decide is it going back in your drawer? Is it going to be in a cabinet, on a shelf? You know, what style of organizing works for you? Do you need to have everything out so you can see things in front of you? Or do you prefer to put things away and have them, you know, hidden behind doors, but yet you know they're there? So assign that home. Then you're going to containerize. And what that means is you want to give it some boundaries. Organizers like to use um, clear containers so they can see what's inside. If you don't like clear containers, you can label things. Um, perhaps paper can go into binders instead of file folders. Um, or you can have the goal of being paperless and um, you know, scanning only the things you need to save and reducing the paper. But figure out what kind of container or holder um, works for you. And then finally, equalize, the E in the process. And that um, stands for maintain. Um, basically, that means you want to consider how you're going to move forward with this system. And if this is something that's hopefully easy for you, so it doesn't have too many steps to you know, going through and figuring out what happens with it. So you're sorting, you're purging, you're assigning a home, you're containerizing, and then you will equalize or maintain what you have. OK, number two, give everything a home. Many of you have heard of the expression, a place for everything, everything in its place. Um, it's simple, but often overlooked. Um, we're too busy, right? We have too many excuses, too many things going on. Um, but if you don't give things a home and know where they go, you kind of can't put it away, right? You can't put it away if it doesn't have a place. Um, because then you won't be able to find it. Um, you won't be able to find it later if you don't give it a place. So designate areas and spaces where things go in your space, so you can um, quickly find them. And just um, kind of a. a uh, interesting um, piece. The floor is not a home or a storage space. I work in lots of um, home offices and um, professional offices in the workplace where um, you know boxes of, of extra copy paper or other things are kind of slid under um, people's desks. So there's nowhere um, to put your feet, really. Um, it's not ergonomically correct. Um, and also just piles. We tend to pile on the floor as well. But um, we need to lift all of those things off the floor and um, not be using using the floor as a storage area. It's really not professional and um, it's not safe for us either, honestly. So um, if you have things on the floor, let's go have that goal to get them off there. And then like with like, and that means keep like items grouped together. Okay, just like um, you have your emails in folders, hopefully, um, that are um, relating to the same issue or topic um, or theme, you keep like items together in your space. OK, make your space work for you. So what you want to do is you want to set your space up for the things that are happening there. Um, for example, in your home, you give your different rooms in your home names, right? You have a dining room for where you eat. You have a living room for where you're you know, spending time with family and relaxing. A kitchen is where we prepare food. 
and sometimes um, eat it as well. But so we, there's there's names to the different um, rooms. We don't so much have that in the workspace. So we never take that step back and think about really what's happening in our spaces and are we setting the spaces up for what is taking place there, right? Are you doing research in your space? Are you meeting with clients? Are you working on your computer, talking on the phone, having staff meetings? Is your space shared? Okay, so define your space. What are its needs? What are its uses? How is it working for you? Um, or how is it not working for you? And what can you do to think about modifying that? And then something I like to do with clients is to um, have them think about zones. And um, that would be dividing your space, no matter how big it is or how small it is, into individual zones. And the most important zone is your active work zone. And that's what I call the space that um, if you drew a circle around yourself, kind of a 360 degree circle, you would be able to reach anything you needed to do your job each day. Okay, and you want it to match the function, like we said. So if it's, you know, staff meetings that are taking place, um, you know, in that circle, you should be able to reach anything you need for those staff meetings. Besides, obviously, the the staff people that will be sitting around you, but the files, the papers, a computer screen you might need to refer to, um, everything in that active work zone. Other zones that you can set up in your space are um, technology zones. Oftentimes, if you have you know scanners and printers and other pieces of um, technology in your space and you don't want them cluttering up your active work zone, set up a space a little bit further away from where your active work zone is and put your technology there. Um, supply zones, um, extra office supplies. Um, another popular zone for um, folks in the workplace is a reference zone. So um, sometimes that takes the um, form of a bookshelf or um, wall shelves, um, just where you can refer to materials that you don't have to look at every day, that are not active and um, engaging for each day. Then you want to make sure you look up. You can see the image um, we have on the screen here. There's a nice use of vertical space in the office and um, the horizontal space or the, um, the workspace is used for work and you can actually um, have that space and see the desktop because the vertical space is used well and, and that's something you want to think about. Look up, right? The um, shelves, the back of doors, um, wall dividers, wall pockets, um, even putting clipboards up to hold um, important papers. Really think about how you can use your vertical space. Um, and then think about having the right tools that you need. Um, sometimes it's important to have your personality reflected in your space, but you don't want to overdo it. You want the functionality to work um, and balance with the personality. So um, you know, personalize, but don't overwhelm. You want to be able to work efficiently. That's your goal. Put it away now. So now rather than later, um, we have a tendency when we get busy to just drop things. Right? We go to a, a meeting and we come back to our office and we're running to another meeting so we really don't have time to you know, file away papers or um, you know, put something and put something in our computer or something of that nature. So you really want to see if you can build time in to make sure you do it now so you don't have to do it later when it takes more time. Um, roughly, it takes 21 days um, to create a new habit. That's um, debatable, sometimes more, sometimes less. But try things that work for you in your space, but you have to give them time to work. So um, as you're trying some of these new organizational habits, you want to make sure you give them enough time to work rather than abandon them quickly. Um, and remember, one minute to put something away now is less time that it will take you to search for something later if you haven't put it away. Um, and you know it's it's really important to think about the things that you use every day as well. So um, you know just like a drop zone in your home is important. So um, a drop zone would be defined as an area where you put your um, your briefcase or your purse, your cell phone, your keys. You know the the items you're bringing into your home that are going to go back out the next day. Um, you know, have a, a launch pad like that in your office as well. So at the end of the day, you're not searching for all of those things before you're going out the door. Okay, so developing systems and routines. So as I said, organizing is all about systems, um, techniques to manage the workload um, in the workspace. So a system is a skill or a way of doing things. Um, so an example, so alphabetical filing, um, color-coded, 
um, filing or color-coded um, to-do lists, those are systems that you put in place that help you to work more efficiently. And these, um, as we said, become habits over time. And then you move through your work more rapidly, more, um, more rapidly through your day. The systems also help us to keep things in balance, um, both in work and at home. And again, these look different for different people but they set the path to getting more organized. This is true of um, physical space as well as digital space. You know, our goal is to have both of those um, where things are so we can find them. So anything that we're talking about is um, relevant to both. In the digital space, how you manage your inbox um, using apps right, to keep you on track, how often you, p you post on um, Facebook or how often you tweet, Right? So systems and routines for all of that, how many times you check your email a day, really important because you don't want all of that to get so um, out of control that they take up all of your time and you don't focus on the important things that you need to get done. Okay, so getting rid of the piles. Okay, lots of people have piles, um, especially paper. Right? Paper is an enormous challenge for all of us. It comes at us constantly. It never stops. Um, it was voted the biggest burden to small businesses. Um, the first step is kind of to accept the influx, um, but also in balance to that, to really start thinking about ways that you can reduce. Um, you know, maybe it's sending fewer emails that your, you know, your coworkers are, you know, bound to print out. Um, it's it's really important to think about, um, you know, handling it and reducing it. But one of the things I like to work with clients on is really about the paper that you do need to keep. How are you keeping it and not piling it? And as you can see on the screen, we have all sorts of upright holders. And upright holders are key for paper. You want to keep your paper in upright holders rather than pile it. Because piling it, there's, there's no end to the piles. The piles just keep growing. Um, but these holders, I like to call them just right holders. And when they're full, that's your signal to deal with them. Okay, so you know anything that works for you in your space in the center, we have um, sort of magazine holders, um, there's slotted holders. You've seen all of these in office supply stores and other places. There's even um, you know wall pockets um, as well as we said using the vertical space. But the upright holders are key, right? That's what you want to do. You want to have your paper upright, and then when your upright holders are full, you want to um, look at them as just right holders, and then you deal with them. And that's a great way to get rid of the piles, um, both on your desk surface as well as on the floor or anywhere else that they may be developing. And then with paper in general, there's really four steps to um, thinking about paper. Um, so it doesn't get overwhelming to you. The first um, would be to file it if you need to retain it. And um, to think about that filing, maybe it's a paper filing. Maybe it's you know on your d desktop. Maybe it's not um, your desktop, meaning your computer desktop. Maybe it's not something you have to keep in paper form. So really think about whether you do or you don't. Um, the second thing that you do with paper is you have an action that it needs to have done to it. So it sort of gets in the to-do pile. Um, the third would be to recycle it if you don't need it anymore. Or um, the fourth is to shred it, again, if you don't need it and it has personal um, information or confidential information on it. So, um, so try to simplify it in your mind and it doesn't become quite as overwhelming. Um, and also, as we said, think about how the paper is generated in your space. Is it coming to you from colleagues, from bosses, from too much printing out? You know, where's that happening from? Are there subscriptions you can um, cease? Are there ways to um, limit it? And then the um, the um, acronym Ohio, right? Only handle it once is um, used to be you know something we all um, strive for. If if you can um, work that out, that you can only handle something once, and you know it goes immediately to the action that you need to do with it, that's great. So um, you know it doesn't even stay in any of your holders um, or um, get even close to a pile. Okay, so maintain it. As we said before, one of the most important steps in the process, um, it's the equalize the, um, in the um, SPACE acronym. Put time in your calendar to do it, OK? So schedule it. Don't just say you're going to do it. Put it in your calendar, whether you keep a paper calendar or an electronic calendar. Um, if you put the time in, hopefully that will help you to actually make the commitment to doing it. Um, it needs to happen on an ongoing basis, right? Organizing is a process. It's not a one-time event that happens and then never has to happen again. 
And we tend to sometimes need to change the systems and the uh, routines that we develop because maybe we have a different job or a different a different boss or we have a different family situation, um, we have an injury, something that happens makes us um, have to change the way we focus on organizing. So maintaining it is really important. Um, make the commitment to it. And remember that um, aesthetics are important and um, how it looks is key, but the function is what is most important, right? You want to make your spaces work for you. Okay, Jeff, so I think we have our second poll question here. Okay, so what percentage of middle managers miss important information almost every day because it exists within the company, but they cannot find it? Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a real challenge sometimes for um for people to be able to find information in the workplace. And it looks like we're just about done with how, polling everyone. Oh, yeah, we have a couple people still responding. Yep, so 10%, 27%, 59%, or 41%. The percentage of managers that miss important information because they can't find it. Okay, so the poll is closed. So in surveying a thousand middle managers of large companies in the United States and the United Kingdom, 59% miss important information, just as um, all of you had thought or uh, many of you had thought, almost every day because it exists within their companies but they can't find it. Right, and this is, um, you know, it could be paper-based information, it could be computer-based information. That's a lot of missing information and a lot of time that's spent looking for it. Um, so you want to put some of these organizing steps and, um, you know, processes into place so this isn't you. Okay, so some tried and true tips for organizing. Obviously the seven steps are great, um, but just to supplement that, you want to choose a starting point. Um, many of us have multiple areas that we want and need to get organized, so it's really important for you to prioritize and really think through what the areas are that you want to focus on and start small, okay? Start with one and celebrate your success before you move on to the next. It's really important that you focus and finish one area before moving on, although oftentimes spaces are related you want to focus um, because that will help you to actually be more efficient and also um, be more successful in the process. Um, and as, I, as you can see, start small. So small means you know one area. If you can start with one shelf, one drawer, one cabinet, whatever the um, you know the configuration is in your spaces, that's what you want to try to focus on and um, accomplish because it's overwhelming to do everything at once. And not only that, but especially in an office space, as you want to accomplish your work, you're not often able to if your whole entire office is you know in upheaval and um, trying to get organized at the same time. Double or triple is to double or triple the time it's going to take to actually get organized. Um, because organizing involves decision making, as we uh, mentioned before, it takes time, right? If, especially if you're looking through papers and trying to decide whether they need to be retained or not. Um, there's all sorts of decisions and sometimes you may need to refer to somebody else before you decide if something can be saved or um, can be discarded. So it's important to really need, leave enough time to do it, um, sometimes even more than doubling or tripling the time. And then as we mentioned before, vertical space, so key to the, um, the process to look up, right? See in your spaces what is a possibility in terms of lifting things off of the horizontal surfaces, lifting things off of the floor so that you're not keeping them there, so that we're getting to that professionalism that we really want to reflect in our spaces um, and the simplicity and um, functionality that we want to achieve. 
a buddy or colleague is a, a fantastic idea for um, many people that want some accountability and um, motivation. So perhaps you have a colleague that you um, like and trust and want to work with them. So you help perhaps them organize some spaces and then they can help you. Um, you can also use a buddy or a colleague to um, bounce you know, sort of decisions off of as you're in that purge mode and um, getting rid of things. Sometimes we get you know, a little too motivated and um, just start tossing everything. And sometimes it's good to have someone there especially a colleague in the workplace to just you know double check say what you know what do you think you know do you think I'm gonna need this um, that's oftentimes you know a good way to um, keep things in check for yourself rather than you know to get so um, focused on the task at hand that you get rid of everything and then you decide later that it was essential and you needed that so those are some tried and true tips um, from you know, just the basic piece of organizing um, and now I want all of you to think about where you're going to begin. Um, take a step back, look at your space. How do you work? How do you live? We all move so fast in our um, busy world that I think we marginalize the importance of skills um, such as organization sometimes. Um, but taking the time to get organized now are going to reap you lots of benefits. Um, as we talked about before, reducing the stress, being more productive, having uh, more time to focus on the important tasks at hand. Um, so I want to thank you for spending some time listening to these details. And we're going to open it up for questions so we can you know, focus on specific things that you're thinking about in your spaces and places. Well, thanks again, Marilyn. Uh, and as a reminder, everybody, feel free to use the Q&A chat box at the bottom of your screen to type in your questions for Marilyn while we have uh, have her here dedicated to the BU alumni community. I'm going to make a small adjustment here, Marilyn, just so I can see some of the questions coming in. Um, Ginny is wondering if in working with clients, if you have a different strategy for office organizing versus home organizing, or do all of the same principles apply? That's a great question, Jenny. Um, in the most um, broad sense, the same principles apply. But in the workplace, sometimes you have to save things that you'd rather not save. And so I think in that way, it's a little bit different. It's more of a, um, sometimes I have to retain things because they refer to certain projects or past projects or, um, you know, the, the institutional archive or something like that. So sometimes I think the decisions are a little bit different. They're not, um, you don't have as much freedom sometimes to part with things. Um, but pretty much the strategies should be similar in terms of, you know, using the acronym we refer to in um, different spaces to declutter and then to set up systems and the one other piece where it may differ is in your home you're usually sharing the space with others and so then there has to be a balance to the organizing and um, a lot of communication that goes on in terms of the needs for things but the basic principles yes are the same Great, and then John, uh, I'm going to paraphrase paraphrase his question. It's a little bit long, but um, he's sort of doubting that you know, uh, with everything that you talked about of making decisions now um, and and you know, finding a place for everything immediately as opposed to waiting, um, feeling like he can't do that, and so he's wondering if you have tips for either monthly or quarterly organization for to get started for somebody who maybe doesn't feel like they can commit to to figuring this all out right now. Yeah, well, that's a great question, John, and I think um, that's really great that you are thinking like that because if you're not ready to get organized, you, you kind of shouldn't jump in. Um, so I think it's really key for you to, to think about that, and it is really smart to think about what does work for you. So if you prefer to have a monthly goal, um, a quarterly goal, a, an annual goal or biannual goal, whatever it might be, um, that's why I refer to the starting small. Um, there may be one small piece of it that you can bite off now, but you don't have to do absolutely everything because I actually think it's overwhelming to do everything at once. So if you, for example, if you can't um, focus on your paper now, maybe you can just focus on paper that's in one area or the paper that you bring back to your office from meetings. Um, so you really shrink down what you're trying to focus on. And then absolutely, having goals um, for you across the board that are more based on your timeline 
that means you know yourself really well and you know what's realistic and I think that's fantastic that's um, that's one of the keys to organizing is understanding sort of how the systems can work for you and if you can recognize that you know I can't do everything now I'm not gonna have a place for everything but it can happen maybe over time that's great I think um, that definitely works does that does that feel like that answers that question well, I'll, we'll see if he uh, chats back in, but it certainly seemed reasonable to me. Um, Aspasia has asked an interesting question, um, something certainly that's happening in the workplace. So, uh, Marilyn, can you please provide tips for people working in nomadic co-working spaces? Sure. So I'm guessing that means you're you're traveling from you know place to place. Um, I think you need um, you need something to bring with you whether it's a briefcase or a backpack or something that is um, handy to carry most of what you need with you and maybe it's just your laptop or tablet that you need um, but usually there's a few other things that might be necessary whether they're cords or writing instruments or other things so I think you want to look at the sort of mobile pieces that travel from place to place um, and then I know that a lot of people that um, work sort of in that nomadic sense from place to place also um, sometimes deal with noise issues too because sometimes the places are higher in um, sound levels than others so you know headphones or headsets and things like that um, to focus but I mean the same principles apply so you know the less you have with you to do things the better but focus on the essentials you know whatever you need to be comfortable and to be efficient and to get the job done um, so I think it's it's usually in that case um, very close to you know the what you carry with you from place to place and having that and maybe sometimes what's in your car too um, and sometimes um, you can set up some sort of a like a, a bin in your car with some essentials that you can pull out if you need them to take with you into the workspace you're working in that day um, that's often um, important as well and I think that balance from home to office space is also important in that nomadic situation because sometimes you're leaving things you know at home because you're not probably leaving things in a in a workspace if you're going from space to space so um, there's a lot of thinking I think that needs to take place there but it's really that like what are you carrying with you um, and what does that have um, you know compartments for that's really key we've got some really great questions coming in Marilyn so I'm glad we have a few minutes left in the hour um, question about archiving or digitizing uh, papers and photos are there any specific tools that you can recommend for people that uh, need some help doing that yeah so there's um, we'll have to think a little bit more about that but um, there's definitely apps out there for doing that and um, you should take a peek at different apps that um, you know might be you know googling the um, the possibilities I'm just taking a peek at um, some apps I have listed here for um, for suggestions but um, the so let's see so um, obviously well Evernote is more active rather than archiving um, for digitizing but it depends I think on the nature of um, what you're doing but I think researching different apps that can do that is key and then also really thinking hard about why those things are being um, archived um, because I notice a tendency in places to when you're um, doing that digital archiving people save more than they would um, if it were paper because they think oh well this is just you know being archived I can access it anytime I need it um, and then there's some very very large um, number you know the 90 percent range of how much information is ever referred to again that's filed away that's both um, paper filing and digital filing so actually the first thing I think I would ask is you know how much of this does really need to be saved and and will be referred to again um, let's see so yeah so yeah, I'm looking at it I'm um, looking at some of these apps that I have here and I don't think any of them answered that question specifically so I'm happy to if um, folks want to um, 
get in touch with me offline, I can give you some specific ideas for that um, in terms of apps. But that's where I would go with that. Um, and also within the industry that you work in as well, sometimes um, professional organizations in your industries make suggestions about different kinds of ways to um, archive um, digital information. So that's something to think about as well. I know different industries are very um, specific about that, and some have more um, content and information than others. Marilyn, thanks for making yourself available for follow-up. What's the best way for our guests to do that today? Just If they visit your website, which you've got listed there, csimplicity.com, can people sure, get in touch yeah, with you? Exactly. Yeah, that's fine. And um, there's a, a contact um, part of the website. You can just um, you know put in information, and I'll definitely get back to you. Great. Uh, my friend Karen has a really interesting question. Um, uh, Karen's office has files, both print and electronic, that are left over from previous employees who are no longer there. Uh, there. And they basically leave those materials as is because they worry that they might need them someday. So any tips on how to tackle that problem and whether it's even worth organizing somebody else's materials in your workspace? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, that's it's the institutional memory, but at the same time, it may be completely, you know, unnecessary. So. My guess is, is if it hasn't, if it's information that hasn't been referred to in quite a long time, it's probably not necessary. That being said, again, it's industry dependent on, um, you know, if this is, you know, a law office and there are, you know, legal cases there that may need to be reopened. Hard to say that you can just um, get rid of it. Um, but I think it's really important in that case to think about the um, sort of three different areas of paper. It's kind of the active, the reference, and the archive. And it's obviously not active paper if you haven't been referring to it on um, a regular basis. It may not even be reference if um, nobody's ever looked at it. So it's probably in the archive category. So I think your company or organization needs to kind of come up with some policies about what is archive doable and you know what is um, what's the most essential things, what are the things we need to save? Do we need to save papers from past employees? Um, what are these papers? Um, so you know, coming up with some criteria about how that happens, rather than just saying, because these have never been you know, referred to before, we'll never need them again. Um, again, industry specific, and um, you know, depending on sort of the you know, organizational, institutional memory, you know, what, what's essential. There's, um, I have a museum background, and I know in, um, Museums oftentimes, you know, there's a program that took place, you know, 15 years ago that maybe they want to have it again. And although things have changed, there's some things that are consistently the same as well. So it's nice to be able to refer to things. Um, but the other thing I notice in companies is that um, sometimes multiple staff people save the same things. So that's the other thing to think about with the the previous employees' um, papers and electronic information. Do they have the same things that somebody else has? Um, and then you have duplication of effort, and you don't need to be saving, you know, multiples of the same thing. Um, so you know, you have to really think about what your business is and where you're you're going with, um, you know, with your goals and objectives, um, and you know, set some set some guidelines. You know, do you have a, a process for archiving? Um, if there is none, you know, maybe it's worth looking through some of the papers that are there, and and what are they? You know, how, how important are they? Great. And then Cynthia ha has asked a question that I'm going to um, alter slightly. Uh, Cynthia is wondering if uh, you have tips for organizing your pocketbook, so all the things in there. I guess that we could sort of augment that to say whether it's a briefcase or just anything that you're using to carry materials on the go. So any quick tips about that? Absolutely. So um, the first is to um, try the organizing sort of acronym that we did, that um, the space um, piece, to empty it out and to really look at what you have there. You know, sort it, um, purge what you don't need. Um, when it comes to the assign a home and containerize pieces, um, it's usually really effective to have individual holders within a purse 
or a briefcase, um, sometimes even clear holders and containers. So, you know, perhaps you want um, something to hold your, you know, tablet or smartphone. Perhaps you want something to hold your um, pens and um, any other writing instruments you might have, something for makeup if it's, um, if that's relevant, um, maybe some snacks. So individual holders, so not everything is thrown in together is great. And if those holders can be clear, so you can easily, you know, take them out and um, sort of the idea of, you know, how we're all carrying our um, cosmetics onto airplanes these days, you know, in the clear, um, you know, sort of purses or containers, um, that's great. And um, you can find those in a myriad of different places. But I would say the, the best objective for things we carry daily is to have smaller holders within them. Um, but before you do that, make sure you go through and purge, you know, make the decision about what's really essential. Because oftentimes, um, people just kind of toss things into pocketbooks and briefcases, um, but don't pull things out that aren't necessary. Marilyn, thanks again for doing this for our webinar. You know, you and I were joking uh, before we got started today that um, today was an exception for me. Normally my desk is uh, kind of a mess. I'm certainly a piles person, but obviously knowing that you were coming to visit me today, I tidied up a little bit. But um, you, you offered some really great actionable steps for, for people to, to start to get organized. And so I just wanted to say thank you again for your time and uh, giving this info out to our alumni. Sure. And, um, you know, as I said, feel free to visit my website and um, be in touch. And, you know, people should celebrate, you know, small successes and organizing is a process. So um, it's not a one time event. And, um, you know, if you're not ready to do it, you know, don't feel like you have to jump in. But, um, you know, when you are ready, it's it definitely um, has benefits as we reviewed. Yeah. Well, thank you again, Marilyn, and I also want to thank all of our guests for participating today. Uh, we've got a great webinar coming up in May. Uh, we might have a couple spots left. Uh, it's about um, being an introvert in, the, in today's workplace. Uh, we've got a, another webinar coming up in June, and we also recently launched a really interesting and unique series of online speed networking events for BU alumni. So I encourage you to, to visit our website at bu.edu alumni to, uh, slash alumni to see about all the great events we've got coming up. And as always, if you or any BU alum you know would be interested in presenting a professional development webinar or have a topic that you'd like to showcase for the Alumni Association, feel free to contact me uh, at the Alumni Relations Office or by email at jtmurphy at bu.edu. Thank you, everybody, for your time. Have a great day or a great evening, wherever you might be.